Good evening, everyone. I am so delighted um, this evening in honor of Black History Month to present uh, some of the incredible and extraordinary leaders of the National Bar Association, past and present. You know, in order to understand the history of an organization, you have to talk to those who made history, those who shaped history, those who were there in the trenches. In 1925, we all know, we understood that there was a need to create this extraordinary organization because we were denied entry into the ABA, the American Bar Association, and any other bar association. They were, we were told, no, we weren't good enough. No one wanted to see us. No one wanted to hear us. No one wanted to hear what we had to say or even talk to us. But yet we had communities that we had to serve. We had to support each other. And, and so from that was the creation of the National Bar Association. Actually, it was called something else before, but it evolved as the name was the National Bar Association. And over the years, we, we have seen the rich legacy of this organization um, that we all love and serve. We, we saw you know, Thurgood Marshall, we saw Johnny Cochran, we saw Charles Hamilton Houston. Um, we see our modern day heroes, Arthenia Joyner, Kim Keenan, uh, Yvette Simmons, Robert Harris, Willie Gary, Ben Crump. I could go on and on and on and on with the rich legacy of this organization. But for Black History Month, where we honor our heroes and our sheroes, I just wanted to ensure that our organization heard from some of our extraordinary leaders um, from yesteryears. And so against that backdrop, I'm just going to introduce very briefly some of these legends. Each one of these past presidents is a legend and gave so much to the organization. Because to understand how we got here today, you have to know where we came from. What were the pressing issues during their administration? What were the crises? We're confronting pandemics today, literally COVID-19, police brutality, and voter suppression. I dare say we've been confronting voter suppression from the inception since we had the right to vote, but each president had his or her own special blend of magic that they put into this organization, and that's what we're here to discuss. So I'm going to start with past president Arthenia Joyner. We know her as Senate, Senator Arthenia Joyner. Because I lived in Florida and because I had the pleasure of seeing Senator Joyner, past president Joyner in action, I can tell you firsthand she was, and some would say still is, the most powerful person in the Florida Senate. She in my impression, when I was there, when we saw her, when we were in, when I was in Florida, she ran things in the Senate. And that she was an African American woman and broke down so many barriers and forms the extraordinary leader that we have today. So in 1973, y'all have to think back to 1973, and some of the listeners weren't even born then. When a, when a young group of young bucks at the National Bar Association, including Senator Arthenia Joyner, decided that it was time to, I don't want to say take over, but I'm going to let Senator Joyner say it in her words in 1973. Just think about, about how unprecedented that was for her to take over as treasurer of the National Bar Association. You know, she was only the second woman to be president of the National Bar Association, but almost 10 years before she took over as the treasurer. We just need to understand how that in and of itself, that one act was history in its making. So I just first wanted to introduce to anyone, I don't, I can't imagine there's a single member of the National Bar Association who doesn't know Senator Arthenia Joyner, but I just wanted to reintroduce her to you all as we celebrate her contributions, extraordinary contributions, not just to the National Bar Association, not just to Florida, but to this country, as she has been a representative of the US government sent by the president of the United States back in the day. And so um, past President Arthena Joyner, we salute you and we welcome you to this discussion. So I'm, what I'm going to do is just briefly go down the list to say a few comments about everyone, and then I'm going to come back to you, um, President. I want to say President Senator Arthena Joyner. Next, when we talk about what well, we heard it from Vice President Kamala Harris's own mouth, she said she wanted to salute her cousin, past President Bob Harris. I just throw that in there. 
but we know him at the National Bar as an extraordinary leader who was a 37th president of the National Bar Association. He was president from 1979 to 1980. We know him also from all the work he's done with the Boule. We know that he's a, a Kappa man. I mean, I just say that, throw that in there, past president Bob Harris. We know that he's an attorney for Pacific Gas and Electric for 17 years, that he was a trailblazer, that he, while in the law department, argued and won a major free speech, that's freedom of speech case, before the US Supreme Court in 1986. The only lawyer in Pacific Gas and Electric's history to argue and win in the high court. He's extraordinary. He's an activist. He's a business leader. He's a writer. He's a writer. He's got books published. And he's just, he just gave so much to the National Bar Association. Just think of 1979. He was president of the National Bar Association. Bob Harris, past president Bob Harris, we salute you. And we honor you today as one of our heroes of the National Bar Association leadership. Unfortunately, um, past president Jim Cole couldn't join us, but he too was legendary, but we will catch him at another time to honor him. Yvette Simmons, Yvette Simmons was the seventh woman to serve. We talked about past president, Senator Arthena Joyner as the second woman to serve as president of the National Bar Association. Yvette Simmons, also from Florida, there's a Florida theme here, was the seventh president <laughs> of the National Bar Association. I have to tell you, it's a point of personal privilege for me to talk about Yvette Simmons because she really led the way for me, I look at it this way, when I became a partner at Gary Williams Parenti and Al. She was one of the first women lawyers there. And but for her and her blazing the trail, I would dare say I never would have been a partner there. She's extraordinary. She uh, has always been one of the trailblazers. She had a lot of interesting issues to confront during her presidency at the National Bar Association. And we're gonna ask her to talk about that. She has been um, just a trailblazer in her community, um, being a name partner in her own firm, um, being a partner in a major firm in Florida and just blazing a trail for women and young lawyers throughout the state of Florida and nationally and internationally. So again, Past President Yvette Simmons, we salute you, we welcome you, and thank you for allowing us to honor you today as one of our heroes, our sheroes at the National Bar Association. And finally, last but not least, I'd like to introduce to many of you and, and just reintroduce you all um, to Kim Keenan, who I think many, we, we all know Kim Keenan. Um, Kim Keenan, what could I say about Kim Keenan? that she was the eighth woman to serve as president of the National Bar Association, that she was the first woman to serve, to be appointed, to serve as the general counsel fully, completely of the NAACP. As general counsel of the NAACP for five years, it was someone that uh, transitioned into that position, a woman previously. That she has been the chair of the board of more organizations than I can count. That she has led the way for countless young African-American men, but particularly women. And wherever she went, she made sure that she blazed a trail so it would be better for those who came behind her. She's a lecturer, she's a writer, she's a trial, she teaches trial masters, and she's a supreme trial lawyer as, as well. She's a mediator, and she's an executive vice president of Odyssey Media and general counsel right now. Kim Keenan, um, we worked at the same firm many, many years ago. I want to say it was 1990. And my secretary confused us every single day of her existence and would give me give Kim my documents. So Kim would stop by to say hello. And my secretary would say, oh, here are your documents. She could not distinguish us. So I, I wore that as a badge of honor, Kim, in the early 90s. I wear it as a badge today to be, because people confuse us a lot. We're both from Buffalo, New York, and you're indeed my sister. And it gives me great joy and honor to reintroduce you to the world and to everyone and to thank you just as we thank past president Arthenia Joyner, past president Yvette Simmons, past president Robert Harris, and all of the other past presidents of this magnificent organization for your contributions. So Kim, Arthenia, Yvette, and Robert, 
We salute you and thank you. And now I'm gonna start with the questions. And this is designed to be really interactive so that you can speak your truth. We wanna know, we wanna know how the NBA got to be this majestic organization that it is now. And the best way to find that out is to go straight to those who helped to create it and make it this way. Starting with past president, Senator Athenia Joyner. I talked about 1925 how the NBA was created. That was one of the driving forces. We were, the doors were closed to black lawyers during that time. But based on your experience and knowledge of the NBA, what was the driving force? And when you were president of the NBA, um, Senator Joyner, what was the driving force for you as you strove for excellence and thought for black lawyers nationally and internationally? Because like you said, before we had all these international trips, you all were international lawyers making a difference. And for you, it was in the 70s when you first became um, very active in an officer of the National Bar Association. Thank you, Madam President, for inviting me to participate. Well, my involvement with the National Bar goes back to my law school days when T.J. Cunningham, uh, Florida Black lawyer in West Palm Beach, be came to a Florida a University and met with some of us who were members of the student bar. And he reached out and told me that if you wanna be successful, you've got to be a member of the National Bar Association. So that was my first introduction. And he said, we have a Florida organization. It's called Lambda Epsilon Chi Legal Fraternity. And so uh, that was my beginning. And the, the next year, I became president of the student bar and I wanted and I was invited to go to the ABA law student division meeting in Hawaii. And the ABA said, if you get to California, we'll pay your way to Hawaii and back. Well, I didn't have any money. TJ said, don't worry about it. So he took me to the Lambda Epsilon Chi meeting and all of the black lawyers in Florida, about uh, 30 some contributed. And that's how I got to Hawaii. And I tell you, they gave me so much money. I went to Hawaii, New York, DC, Tallahassee. It was wonderful. So when I graduated from law school, of course, my first stop was in fact, the a uh, National Bar Convention in New York in 1970. And oh my God, as a young lawyer, this was so exciting, invigorating. All of these outstanding black lawyers from all over the country with their expertise and their families and their money. They made big bucks to those of us who were just starting. They flashed their hundred dollar bills and we, they talked about their cases. And I knew then that I was in an organization that cared about people and we discussed all of the issues that affect black people in America and what we can do in order to make life better for us and our people. So I just jumped right in and started working in 1972 in Miami. We, the women organized and the women's division was founded, not without some kickback from some fuss from the boys, but we overcame that. We said, we are meeting, we met and we organized. And so in 1973, I went to San Francisco to the convention and decided when I got there, along with Bob Harris, Golden Johnson, Alice Bonner, and a few others, I'm gonna run for office. I wanna be treasurer. And they said, you can't do it. This man, C.C. Spaulding is a millionaire lawyer. He runs, he owns his big insurance company. And Bob was right there, he said, you can do it. And so we called ourselves the Young Turks. And we came together, organized, and I won. And that was the beginning of the change within the National Ball from the old guard to the new young guard. And from that evolved Bob Harris as president, Junius Williams. And I know that our coming in at that point in time made all the difference in the life of this organization that we love so dearly. Absolutely. So, so now we're talking about the Young Turks and you mentioned past president Bob Harris. 
So Pastor President Harris, that's a great segue into your journey with the National Bar Association. And how, based on your experience um, being president um, at that time, the 37th president, how has the mission of the National Bar and your impression changed over the years? And talk to us a little bit about your journey into it. You were part of these young Turks that took over the organization. You know, Senator Joyner was right there. Y'all were like, we're gonna take over and make a difference. Mm -hmm. And you did. So talk to us a little bit about that journey. Well, thank you, uh, President Hopla. Uh, for inviting me to be a part of this uh, historic occasion. Uh, let me add to uh, Athenia uh, Joyner's uh, comments about her running for treasurer in 1973 in the city of San Francisco. Uh, it, it was awesome because here was a young uh, lawyer uh, who was in the words of some, still wet behind the ears, but taking on this older person and being willing to stand up to him. And she did. And uh, actually, uh, C.C. Smalden, to my knowledge, has not yet not returned to the NBA <laughs> since she beat him. He was so shocked. He still cannot believe that she did what she did. But uh, uh, over the years, the National Bar uh, I wouldn't say really change, it transitioned so that it meets the uh, uh, time in which it exists. Uh, for example, uh, uh, when I became president of the National Bar, uh, I was uh, 34 years old, which was relatively young at that particular time. And uh, <clears throat> I thought it was my uh, mission uh, as part of the National Bar Association was to make the bar relevant to, to the society in which it existed. Uh, I recall specifically uh, in 1980, when, uh, <clears throat> when I was president, that um, the ABA sent a fella from San Francisco to argue on behalf of the ABA uh, Judiciary Committee that, and, and listen to this, uh, young lawyers need to understand this, to argue that Fred Gray was not qualified to be a federal judge. So as I sat in the Senate hearings and listened, and of course I testified on behalf of Fred Gray, uh, that it was amazing that anybody could come and argue against the credentials of Fred Gray. But the ABA did, and I can tell you, the National Bar Association took the ABA on, and we did everything within our power to make certain that they never did that again. And guess what? They never did it again because of what, <clears throat> what we heaped upon them. The, the, uh, when I say he, I mean the, uh, uh, the, the, the amount of uh, <clears throat> dissatisfaction that we displayed to the NBA, uh, to the ABA was, uh, was, was uh, insurmountable at that particular time. It was something that we were willing to do. Uh, other things that we <clears throat> took on were every case concerning affirmative action uh, that we, uh, that came up, the NBA was a part of it in terms of filing amicus briefs, et cetera. Uh, we did not miss an opportunity to stand up and be counted regardless of the issue. So uh, we were relevant. And, and, and in those days, as it is today, uh, we, really believe firmly uh, what Charles Houston talked about when he said a lawyer is either a social engineer or a parasite on society. We never wanted to be a parasite on society, so we had no choice. We were social engineers. And uh, I don't want to get carried away, but uh, Madam President, thank you for this opportunity. Well, well, first of all, you know, this is an opportunity for us to hear from you all because you all have helped to shape and transform this organization. So now I'm gonna to go to past president Yvette Simmons. 
Um, your vision. I want to talk about your vision for the for the National Bar Association. You were the seventh um, pres seventh woman president of the National Bar Association. You were president <laughs> during a very interesting time. Talk to us, um, past President Simmons, about your journey as um, president of the National Bar Association and your vision for your year. Forgive me, I just realized that I was on mute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, then. I look at uh, past President uh, Joyner, and I was her special assistant. I mean, she was the, um, the attorney that inspired me to become a part of the National Bar Association. And then from her to Fred Gray, who was her president-elect, I was his special assistant, and um, he inspired me. And with those two um, um, uh, pioneers as my, um, my, my mentors, I, I just um, fell in love with the, the National Bar Association. Um, I didn't think that I would ever be president until I became president. But my theme was um, from social, National Bar Association, from social engineer to economic engineer, the next frontier. And that's uh, uh, um, past president um, Joanna and, and Harris, that, they, they were in, very involved with, with the civil rights aspect, and we were too, but we, we needed to get to that next step, and that, that was dealing with how can we become more viable and more economically independent as, as, as not just as attorneys, but as, as a, a, a community. And so um, my, my dream was to get us more and more involved with um, economic opportunities. We dealt with, with issues with, with young people because we realized that, that no matter what was happening was that no matter how many years went by, we still didn't seem to get more attorneys. I mean, we still had the same percentages in terms of the number of black attorneys in the, um, in the practice. And so we started a, um, a law gap uh, uh, that would help us to grow our own attorneys. And that law camp has been going on for 20 years. Unfortunately, COVID didn't, didn't help very much, but we, we will resume getting uh, uh, black uh, young people from across the country um, and, and, and to, uh, in high school so that we can motivate them to want to be able to go to college and then from there go to law school. Because if we don't look at our young people and bring them in, who, who will do that? But during my year, year as president, we had some um, um, tremendous activities. I mean, we, we, that was the, it was 2000, it was the year of the election. We filed an amicus brief in the, in the case of uh, Gore uh, um, uh, versus Cheney and Bush. And, um, and um, we, we also, during that period, <laughs> was a time when, when the organization uh, was involved with the Adams Mark issue. And that was a situation where the, um, uh, uh, the Adams Mark had, uh, when we were in, um, in um, St. Louis, uh, our past president uh, Brown was, um, was uh, uh, treated improperly by the Adams Mark. In fact, they went into her, her uh, up to her room and just uh, complained. It was just obviously racially motivated. And ultimately, the NAACP uh, started a boycott, and they held the boycott. Um, they started a boycott the same month as our convention, and I went to their convention and asked if they would just hold off for just 30 days to get let us get through our convention. They did for the medical association if they would just do it for the national bar. Unfortunately, they didn't do it for the national bar, and so consequently, um, our convention was. Um, what, what I thought was going to be a, a tremendously economically um, a turn for the National Bar Association became a challenge of just dealing with, um, with our, our members struggling with, do I honor the boycott or do I um, um, make sure our organization continues economically? So, um, so it, it was a challenge, but it was, a, it was like, um, uh, I, I, I told uh, the, the organization that I felt like I was a, um, 
I had been to through the um, Sorrow's Kitchen and licked the pots clean. It was such a tremendous thing, but it was it was good for us as an as an organization in terms of of of, of sticking together. We dealt with the litigation, um, and, and one other thing too is that um, be, before I became president, it was the seven. We, we were coming embarking upon the seventy fifth anniversary of the National Bar Association. And President Pope, Harold Pope was the president at that time. And we did, we for the three conventions leading up to that, we had walks for justice. We went to the, um, uh, in, in, when we were in Memphis, we walked from the Peabody to the Lorraine Hotel. Reverend Billy Cow, who, who was, uh, was there with Dr. King, was there with us and he shared with us the entire story. And then when we were in Pennsylvania, we went to the first African American, uh, African Episcopal church, and, and we, we, we had uh, such information about that. And then we went to the, the final, because the convention, the 75th was in Washington, we went to the Supreme Court. We gave a um, um, 15,000 to the Tuskegee Human Rights uh, Multicultural Center in honor of Fred Gray during that time. We, it was just a, um, uh, tremendous time in terms of dealing with both civil rights issues, electoral issues, uh, youth issues, and, um, and economic issues. So it, it, was a, uh, it was a tremendous time. And, and one last thing is that when I was, um, when, when uh, President Cole, who's not here with us, but was supposed to be here with us, was president, um, he had a speaker to come in, and that speaker said that we need to stop confusing movement with progress. And it's a, and, and that same year, I saw do, saw um, Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall at the NAAC, I mean, NBA convention, walking down the hall, and he he spoke to me, and I and those things it just uh, just shaped me in terms of recognizing how proud I am to be a part of an organization that has provided me with so many, so much, so many opportunities and, 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 and so much history and, and so much knowledge. Thank you so much, um, past President Simmons. And I know that past President Athenia Joyner, talk a little bit also about just some of the things, your mission and some things that happened during your year. Thank you, Madam President. Well, this was 1984 and Jesse Jackson was running for president. So the national, so immediately after my installation, it became all about voter voting rights, voter education, voter registration, get out the vote, mobilize all of the affiliates, affiliates and we go right in and we became very active participants in the election. And we also uh, initiated a census of black lawyers in America. And we set out to try to get an accurate count of how many of us were actually out there in the practice of law. Um, we, we were on the, internationally, we had a past president named William Turk, Honorable William Turk Thompson, and he was the Director General for the World Peace Through Law Conference, and he took, he sponsored some of our members to his World Peace Through Law Conference, and fortunately, I was one of those persons along with the president, my first president I served under, and that was Archie Weston, and we went to Cote d'Ivoire to the conference, all because of our NBA members. So Turk had been uh, participating internationally long before I ever got to be a lawyer, any of us, back in the 60s. So the National Bar has always been right there in the uh, threshold of all that was important as it related to civil and, uh, and, and equal rights and justice for Black people all over the world. So. Some folks think that the international peace started somewhere in the night is no. Turk brought us to the international arena back in the 60s. And as Yvette said about people at our bar, what endears you to the national bar? Yeah, that was Thurgood, Thurgood Marshall, got pictures with him, he even went to the Nassau when we had a board meeting over there. 
um, A. Leon Higginbottom, they, uh, just all of them. And as I go through my memorabilia, I got autographs from almost all of these people on programs that we had at the National Bar. And the one thing that is most dear to me was in uh, 1985, January 8th, Lawyers Against Apartheid Day, I participated in the demonstration at the South African Embassy, along with uh, former Attorney General Ramsey Clark and Georgetown law professor Gola Butcher, and we were arrested. And I, and, and I said it was time for America to get on the right side of justice. The, uh, and so John Crump, our executive director, was right there to assure that I was able to bond out of jail. Big $50. And then an NBA lawyer, Robert Byrd in DC, represented me the next day. And the charges were dropped. But it was because America's black lawyers said, Arthenia, go forth and represent us. And so the National Bar is, is an annual gathering of brilliant lawyers, and it's unique, it's different, it's different from every conference that you go to because you, you learn, you meet people, you participate in intellectual development debate at the highest level like we did in Indianapolis as to whether or not the National Bar would endorse Clarence Thomas. That was the most vigorous debate we ever had. And of course, when the vote was over, it was no, we would not by three or four votes. But suffice it all to say, the struggle continues and as there's much remains to be done. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Kim Keenan, you were the eighth woman president of the National Bar Association. You were the 61st president of the National Bar Association. I had the pleasure of serving as your general counsel. I think we probably went to the first, we together went to the first NBA meeting. I think, was it in Baltimore? Maybe it was before Baltimore. I just remember. Baltimore. In Baltimore, Willie Gary was throwing a party. And we were young lawyers. I think we were practicing at the same firm. And we said, we're going to go to Baltimore because we were in D.C., go to Baltimore and see. And I knew Willie and Gloria Gary for many, many years because my family used to live in Tampa, Arthenia. I think you know my parents. And so I was familiar with the MBA. John Crump told me when I was in law school that there was only one bar association that we had to belong to. And that was the National Bar Association and all the rest were just whatever. And I think he put it that way, just whatever. And so but Kim, I think we went to the first That's annual right. convention That's together so, true. That's true. Um, so many years ago. So let's talk about your presidency, some of the 2006, some of the challenges that you faced, some of the, the missions and your vision for the MBA at that time. So people cannot know what a great joy is in my heart to know that my friend Tracia C.K. Hoffler is the president of the National Bar. I mean, I just like just I just have chills just being on this call because I'm just so proud of her. This is she is the right person at the right time for the NBA. And it, it really does show where we can go and how much bigger and better we will grow over the years. So I I went to my first convention in Baltimore and, um, and then I was recruited to help AJ Cooper, founder of Balsa campaign for president in Chicago. And it, it, would, it would be like somebody sent you somewhere and you thought you were a lawyer. You thought you had seen some lawyers. You thought you'd been to the ABA. You thought you'd been to the trial lawyers and you, you, you just thought I've seen everything. Oh, I've been to all these seminars. I'm gonna go to this you know, it's going to be another convention. And, and it was like, I was dipped, I was dipped in the water. I mean, it was, I had never seen anything like it. I had never seen so many fabulous lawyers from all around the country, younger and older, and just, just really at the top of their game. And I think, um, you know, I remember seeing, you know, Arthenia, you know, stand to argue something. And I, I remember Arthenia with, um, you know, that voice and she would make her point. And then I would see Al Janita and she'd get up, Scott Davis, and she would make her point. And I thought, I have never been anywhere 
where black women commanded, not just spoke, but commanded the floor. And I was so inspired. I, I just really can't even put it into words. I was so inspired. And I came home from there thinking, I've got to be a part of that. I've got to, I, I haven't missed a convention since we went in Baltimore. And it's because this is a part of who I am as a professional. And it, and it, and it, it goes beyond just that we're lawyers, but that we share this commonality, this common experience, and that we are fighting the same fights in different parts of the country all at the same time. So I'm coming behind. I get, you know, the wonderful, great, fabulous honor of being the eighth woman president after Yvette. And uh, she was, you know, she was such a gracious uh, leader and she was always, you know, her tent was always open and I, I'm grateful to be allowed to be the godmother of the camp that she founded and I, I faithfully participate in that um, because, because we're a baton. It isn't just what my vision is. It's what my vision is combined with the visions that have come before me. And I'm, I'm grateful to have my fingerprints on the torch that we're handing forward to the next president. So, you know, like many of the others, I, like Robert Harris, I was approximately the same age he was when he came to the bar. Uh, something about your early 30s when you, you missed out, don't miss out, come early. Um, but you come and you, 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 you can't turn away, you can't turn away and you focus on voting rights I, I, at that time. And I, I'm happy to say the CKs has you know, gone well above this, but uh, it was the largest election protection effort that had been done. We, we, um, we joined with all the other groups of color, APABA, the Hispanic National Bar, we traveled to each other's conventions. We spoke at each other's conventions. We had one of the largest CBAC meetings around that because, you know, we, we were going to each other's. We weren't just saying, come to mine. We were saying, let's go to each other's conventions. And another issue that was near and dear to my heart was judicial nominations and um, future president, um, um, oh gosh, Alfreda Robinson was uh, chair of that committee and our letter um, basically dinging this awful judge who they had put up to be a judge was read from the Senate floor by Senator Kennedy. And, and it was a changing point in how people saw the national bar, right? It wasn't just, you know, we're for black people and we're not for white people. No, they really got to see that we did a reasoned, thoughtful analysis of his failure of, of legal acumen and it was it was very powerful. And I, I just remember thinking, you know, we're a part of something that's bigger than us. And uh, we have to be very, very um, uh, proud of that and, and protective of that. Because, you know, like everybody, you know, wants to say, you know, why, you know, why? Well, well why not is the question that people should be saying, because we have been able to do so many things together, created so many things together, recognized so many of our people. Uh, during my year, we had the Johnny Cochran Legends Award. We created the award um, for corporate, corporate legacy during that time, um, the Cora uh, T. Walker Award for that. We did a lot of things that, that, that stand beyond us. It's not, you know, John Crump, what can deeply be said about him is he taught us that we, we, we are torchbearers, but we hand off. We, it's, not, it's not us. It's not ours. It's, it's the bars. And we leave behind something better than we came to. And, and we, we encourage others to do better than we did. So I'm, I'm just grateful to be a part of this legacy. I can't wait for the other questions. I have all these other people's presidencies I want to touch on and how they inspired me. Um, but I am proud to be the 62nd president of the National Bar and the eighth woman president. And it was 80 years when I was the eighth woman. So I have really dedicated my time since then to supporting other women when they ran, because it's, it's hard. It's hard to be a woman and run for office, but, but we make such a difference, such a difference. That's nothing against the men. I like them too, but it's important that women lead. President Hoffler, could I say something? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, then. In, in listening to, to um, uh, President Keenan, it, it reminded me, and I don't know whether she remembered, but at her, con her convention, her, at her, her annual dinner, um, I uh, wrote a poem 
and this Babe. and this poem uh, how I didn't write it until I was there and I had to be in her suite to get the feel and it's only two pages but I think this might be an appropriate time just as we're reflecting on history to read it and it's celebration of a lady lawyer you walk down a trail blazoned by women who traveling before you found only a forest inviting no entrance right Arthenia Women who looked to the sky and used God's stars to guide them through the maze of injustices that confronted them. Women who had to be tough only to be labeled as brash, persistent only to be labeled as aggressive, determined only to be labeled as combative, ambitious only to be labeled as antagonistic. Mm. Women Love it. who lost many battles but hold you up as proof that they won the war. Women mm. who stand before you to protect you, beside you to embrace you, and behind you to, to, to push you to be the best that you can be. We celebrate you, lady lawyer, lady leader, lady of life. This is your time to shine. Shine so that young women coming to the trail will see the direction mm -hmm. to travel shine so that women who have wandered off the trail can see where to return. Shine so that those women who blaze the trail will know the light still burns. We celebrate you, Lady Lawyer, Lady Leader, Lady of Life. Mm. I am teary. I have to be able to say I am totally in tears. And I have to tell you, one of the greatest moments of my career comes on the heels of, of President Yvette, because I had the opportunity as general counsel of the, of the NAACP to do the graduation speech at Howard for the law school. It's like just the law graduation, they have their own. And I got to hood one of our law campers, Eddie, who we keep acting like he's this little kid, but he is a powerful lawyer in private practice and just killing it. So just imagine he and I both were in tears. Here I am hooding him with his legal robe. And I'm thinking I met him when, I mean, a kid, not, barely a teenager. And it's because what? Because Yvette Simmons had a vision that we would grow our own lawyers and we grew this lawyer and he is a shining testament that we did that. Magnificent, absolutely yeah. magnificent. Yeah. So yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I think this is it's appropriate at this time to to mention some of the other stalwart women of the National Bar, like Cora Walker. Cora founded the commercial law section uh, at a meeting in Chicago when it was freezing, the coldest I'd ever been. And Allie Latimer Wheaton. Allie was the secretary when I won in 1973. She had been secretary for years, so she was the only woman officer, and I was privileged to join her. But these women led the way and, and made it possible for for those of us who are women who should that we stand on their shoulders. And what Cora did was she brought in corporate clients and she got black lawyers and got them involved, founded the commercial law section and the rest is history. And so right. all of those are, uh, divisions, you know, they stand on her shoulders, all of them dealing the corporate right. So all of that was, was, was Cora's dream. And, and she made it real. And I was so blessed to have chaired the commercial law section after I was president, because Bob said, you gonna do that? I said, I gotta keep working. I love this place. What, what young lawyers need to know is this is, this is the Mecca of black legal minds in America. This is where you right. are. This is where you meet all the people. I remember That's Ben nice. Crump as a young lawyer and Johnny yeah. Cochran and all of these people who go on to yeah. be great. But to think that Constance Baker and Third Good and 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 uh, Higginbottom that you could talk to them, and so sit at their feet, and they were there to help us, and you can't get that anywhere else in America, and right. and, and, and and the sense of family. It was a vacation 
I, everybody's kid came. Bob Harrison's baby uh, girl, she was yeah. in Barbados when she was four months old. They flew from California to Barbados. And I have a picture to prove it. But <laughs> we involved our families, our children. We brought our sisters and our friends. And uh, Gwen Eiffel, that's where we first met her. And everybody loved us. And so people need to, young lawyers need to know and understand we have a rich, powerful legacy. And you, we have what nobody else in America can give you. Black lawyers and their legacy have made the difference in this world. And the shining example is Fred Gray. And uh, that's the, and that says it all. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and so I just wanted to add to that. Um, we everybody has mentioned Fred Gray just about. Yeah. And and for those young lawyers who may not quite understand who Fred Gray is, who he really is. So if you want on the on the public sensational side. He was Dr. King's lawyer. He was Rosa Parks' lawyer. He represented the plaintiffs in the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. He was the first African-American to be um, the president of the Alabama Bar Association. He broke through barriers. He argued cases. He was just, he just was and is and continues to be a phenomenal trial lawyer. He goes to work every day at age 90. He is also co-counsel on a voting rights case here in Georgia. That's the Fred Gray, our Fred Gray. There are books written about our Fred Gray. He's not any old Fred, he's our Fred Gray. And we're fighting for him to get the presidential medal of freedom. And, and we're determined, we're not gonna be deterred. We're determined. We will not to be denied. We will not be denied. And so I, I say that because for the younger lawyers, understand the history and understand this is your home as a lawyer. You, there will never be an opportunity I don't care what bar, We're, every bar that you might be told to be a member of, we all are or have been members of. But there's absolutely positively no comparison between any of the bar and the National Bar Association, as you've heard from all the past presidents. And for the BALSA students who may be tuning in, because of how much we believe in the pipeline, we've now put into stone, and it will be finalized, I want to say, in the middle of next month that if you are a member of BALSA at any law school in the world, you will automatically be a member of the National Bar Association for free, and you will have access to us, our programming, our mentorship, and all the magic that we have to bring in what you hear from these past presidents, whose shoulders we stand on, but let's be really clear, we stand on their shoulders, and that's the legacy of the MBA, standing on shoulders, and taking it to the next level. You know, we talked about our kids, you know, we, uh, past president Robert Harris, you had your, your daughter at the National Bar. I had my kids in a double stroller. Now that would look, I just looked some kind of crazy because I had kids late in life and I sure, we had like a traveling caravan, but it was a wonderful thing um, to see your kids grow up in the, in, the, in the tradition of the National Bar, build relationships with other babies, other kids at the law camp, at the, at the other kids, at the, um, the camp during the convention. It's an amazing thing that we could go to, of course, our webinars and do all the substantive things and, and, and be part of panels and, and enjoy the richness. And then while your kids are being taken care of, also go and do some partying. I mean, that's also a part of it. And, and enjoy the National Bar Convention. So I'm going to ask each of you this, um, which could be our final question. Why should, because this is going to be recorded and it will be um, sent to all of the BALSA, our new members, right? All of the BALSA chapters, because they need to understand the history. I'd like each of you phenomenal past presidents who's given so much to say to these students, why the MBA? Why is the MBA relevant? And why must they, as John Croke told me in 1985, why must they belong to the MBA once they graduate from law school? And we'll start with past president Arthenia Joyner. Because this is where you belong. This is where you will be cared, loved, nurtured, and this is where you will learn 
from the best lawyers in America how best to deal with the legal profession. And as, as our president said, the National Bar Convention encompasses everything from having a good time to meeting people, to learning, to participating in all of that intellectual debate. What the National Bar has to offer, you can't get anywhere else. And every, almost every lawyer that I have talked to and gotten them to attend their first convention, they have called and thanked me and said, it was much more than what you even said it would be. And they have never missed another one. So this is family that you as law students must come and take your rightful place. Wonderful. Past President Robert Harris. I've been to every convention of the National Bar Association since I graduated from law school. And I have found that I would not be the kind of lawyer I think I am today were it not for the NBA. The NBA guided my career. And I'm so happy that I listened to what I learned in the NBA because the NBA is an insurance policy. It ensures that you will be successful if you internalize what you learn at the NBA. Finally, the National Bar Association, and, and, and this is so important, will take on issues that other bar associations would never dream of taking on. So you owe it to yourselves. You owe it to future generations to be a member of the National Bar. And if you are not a member of the National Bar, you are doing yourself a disservice. Thank you. Absolutely. Past President Yvette Simmons. So I'm a member of the American Bar Association and I have been chair of, of several of the American Bar Association committees, including pipeline committees. But my grounding is in the National Bar Association. Uh, the National Bar Association, when I opened up my own firm um, before joining a large firm back in 1990, I got my biggest client through the National Bar Association. In fact, uh, Marilyn Hollifield contacted me and said, the FDIC is, 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 um, will be taking on uh, uh, attorneys to, to be a, a counsel for banks. Um, is that something you're interested in? I said, yes. And a, another National Bar Association member that was a part of the FDIC, I flew up to, to Atlanta, met at the, at the airport, came back for, it, 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 I had so many files as a result of that, I had to hire a new, new attorney, that an associate that I got through the National Bar Association. So the, the and the, and the, uh, uh, um, past President Gray, past President Jonah, and, and others um, um, have been such an inspiration. And just um, it, it, you, you, as as you heard, it's a place where you can belong. Now you can't belong if you don't want to belong, because you can go anywhere. And and if it, it, you have to do your part too, to to uh, but you know that they care about you. Some of the other organizations, some of the other associations, you always have that thought in the back of your mind. Is that really, I mean, it's only one of me, it's only two of me, are they really care about me? But when you go to the National Bar Association, they care about you. And if they mad at you, they'll tell you. And you know that they're telling you, and it's nothing, no, no, no um, 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 second motive. It's just you and them. And so, I say when you are part of the National Bar Association, it's like you're coming home. It's a commitment that you have to be a part of the National Bar Association. I've, uh, unfortunately, in the last 38 years, I have missed two conventions. Uh, but, uh, but other than that, I'm a part of it too. Wonderful. Kim Keenan, what say you? I say that uh, if we're not relevant, you are not relevant. And that would be a real problem. Uh, for me, 
you know, <laughs> like they said, this, this is, this is part of my NBA family. This is something that, that I, I do as a part of being the lawyer that I am. And so much of my memories of becoming the kind of lawyer I hope that I am has come from, you know, marching in the streets of Tennessee with Randy, going to the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington and having our own Patricia Rozier speak to that crowd of 300 people, um, you know, going to different events with people who are, you know, leading other organizations. And what were they first? NBA presidents. Like, you know, you look at the Fred, Fred Gray is one of the first presidents of a state bar association. And that was a impetus to me to want to do that in the District of Columbia. And then you look at, and if you look at the ABA and all of us have gone, all of us I have been members, our members go back and forth. But you know, if you look at the three of the four black presidents of the ABA, where did they come from? Oh, that's right. The first one, Dennis Archer came from the NBA. The second one didn't come from the NBA, but he was NBA adjacent. And then of course, Paulette Brown, the only black female president of the ABA is one of our own. And I still remember when she would come and do her reports for the board. I mean, she was, she was all of us for that bar. And then of course, you know, Reggie Turner, who followed me as president, he's going to be the next president of the ABA. So, you know, you think about those other bars and everybody's like, oh, they're, you know, what they are. But you know what? We can be leaders of those too. But we choose, we choose to be here because our roots are here, because people are checking for us here. I still remember Harold Pope calling me saying, you were president of the NBA. Now, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with all that talent? What are you going to do with all that training that we gave you? Because, you know, the NBA will test you. They love you, but they will test you. But the good news is you can't have diamonds without fire and you cannot have triumph without a trial. So that's why it's so important to invest yourself. I think my biggest case that I was ever referred, I was sitting in Jamaica at the small firms and solo practitioners and somebody just walked over to me and gave me a $3 million case. Now that is vacation with, a, with an extra boost. So, um, you know, if you come and you just party and you're missing out on a lot of good stuff, you're missing out on partnerships and collaborations. I, I partnered with Michael Rozier. I mean, you can do anything you want to do because you got a whole coast of colleagues, coast to coast, who want to do whatever it is you want to do. So I, I don't leave home without it. Well, thank you so much to all of you. I would just like to say to the young folks out there. I wish that it weren't the case, but you know, sometimes in your legal career, you are going to confront adversity. You heard past president Bob Harris say that he sat and testified. He represented Fred Gray at that hearing. You heard Kim Keenan talk about the cases that referred to her. Charles Ogletree, one of our members, was the lead lawyer for Anita Hill. So many extraordinary NBA lawyers have been everywhere. It doesn't matter if you're a corporate lawyer, commercial lawyer, civil rights lawyer, personal injury lawyer, employment, bankruptcy lawyer, criminal defense, whatever it is. If you look on TV right now, every single internationally recognized civil rights case is being led by a National Bar Association lawyer. And I dare say leadership. Ben Crump, past president, Daryl Parks, past president, Lanita Baker, current vice president, Chris Stewart, president of one of our affiliate chapters. That's right, we got 80 affiliate chapters, the Gate City Bar. So I say all that to say for the young lawyers, for the young, the law students to know this is your home. When you, and you have brothers and sisters, right? And we are your brothers and sisters. Now you can go and meet friends at other places, that's those other bar associations. But at the end of the day, you put your head on your pillow at the National Bar Association, this home. And we're gonna make it so that it is seamless in the transition so that you become the best and the brightest because you are the best and the brightest that this country has to offer. So to our magnificent panel, to past President Senator, Arthen Senator Arthenia Joyner, thank you. Thank you for the, what you brought to the table tonight, what you have given each and every one of us. You don't have to be a woman lawyer a woman leader to appreciate the brilliance, mastery, and power of Senator Athenia Joyner. So we say thank you, Senator Joyner. To past president Bob Harris, 
your extraordinary success in a corporate environment where you also demonstrated the power of being a social justice engineer, no matter where you are, is what young folks need to see today. No matter who you are, you must have a social justice component because if not, you have to realize your community is looking to you to do that. So past president Bob Harris, we thank you for that. Past president Yvette Simmons, yes, you, I stand directly on your shoulders, not no halfway quarter, directly on your shoulders, just as I stand on the shoulders of past president Arthenia Joyner and Bob Harris, but I directly on your shoulders because your experience informed my experience and being a partner and having a great career, that's an MBA connection. So I wanna thank you for what you've done for me and for so many others. There are so many others that, that, that if they had the opportunity to, to speak to each of you, would tell you simply thank you. And to Kim Keenan, I wanna thank you for being the first of so many. And I would say Kim Keenan was the person. There were other people that were trying to nudge me and I think I just said, I hung up the phone on them. But it was <laughs> Kim Keenan who said to me, CK, now I know we're both from Buffalo. I know you for, and we went in that direction. You need to serve as president of the NBA at this time in history. It was Kim Keenan that placed that call. That was a decisive factor. So to Kim, I say thank you because I don't care what anyone says. This is the best and the baddest organization I've ever seen. This is an honor and a labor of love to serve as your president. COVID, no COVID, some COVID ain't got no, can't see nobody in person. It's still the most magnificent organization and I love all of you. So I say thank you for your legacy and to all the viewers, thank you for tuning in. And as we celebrate our heroes and our sheroes, take them with you wherever you go in whatever room and never forget the National Bar Association. Thank you everyone.